The Phantom began life in the early 1950s as the McDonnell AH-1 twin-engined supersonic attack aircraft. But from May 1955, the design was recast as the F-4H-1 two-seat fleet defense fighter with Mach 2 plus performance and primary armament revised from four 20 millimeter cannon to four Sparrow air-to-air -air missiles semi-recessed in the lower fuselage and supported by powerful search and fire control radar. As such, the F-4H was the world's first fighter with self-contained search and destroy capability. On May 27, 1958, the XF-4H1 prototype was rolled out at Lambert Field, St. Louis, and the first flight was entrusted to test pilot Bob Little. Our intention on that flight was to take the airplane supersonic on its first flight. Uh, we had done that four years before in the F-101, and it was certainly something to be accomplished in the F-4. It didn't work out that way. Landing gear didn't come all the way up. And on that flight, a hydraulic system uh, failed uh, on takeoff, so had to bring the airplane in after about 20 minutes of learning how to fly it well enough so I could land it. As the XF-4H taxied into a position flanked by examples of McDonald's other major fighter program of the period, the F-101 Voodoo, it was clear that the company had a winner on its hands despite the difficulties met in the maiden flight. The story of the Phantom belongs also to General Electric, which provided the J-79 turbojet. The company began work in 1951, aiming to produce a new axial flow engine possessing low weight and great fuel economy at Mach 0.9, but with the strength and thrust for Mach 2 performance. To achieve this, the J-79 used radical design features, the most important being this variable stator compressor with adjustable blades. And the afterburning exhaust nozzle needed for lightweight and optimum performance under the conditions of very high speed flight. This nozzle uses secondary air to control the expansion of the primary exhaust. The secondary air also serving to cool the engine and so remove the need for expensive metallurgical solutions. Two sets of nozzle fingers are interconnected mechanically, opening and closing so that over the complete operating range of the engine, the exhaust is shaped to provide the best relationship between thrust and fuel consumption. The net effect is a two-thirds increase in thrust, though only at the expense of horrendous fuel consumption. The full-scale variable stator compressor unit was tested for the first time in August 1953, returning figures so good that the test crew initially thought that the instrumentation was faulty. At much the same time, the afterburner was connected to a J-73 turbojet and tested with encouraging results. The afterburner was then married to the J-79, allowing the complete new engine to be put in the test cell in June 1954. Some 150 hours on the J-79 were complemented by 800 hours on the J-73 for additional testing. A significant moment in the test program came with the J-79's first running in the field. The engine fires and the test crew immediately checks the instrumentation. Now throttled to idling speed, it is inspected by ground and flight test engineers for fuel or oil leaks, and for any other obvious signs of failure. With this hurdle passed, the engine is opened up to higher speed, and finally shut down. The radical new engine first took to the air in May 1955. The unit was installed in a nacelle that could be extended below the belly of a converted North American B-45 bomber.
This historic film shows the modified B-45 taking to the air on May 20th, 1955. Once the B-45 was safely airborne, the J-79 nacelle was extended and initial test runs flown, confirming the J-79's basic capabilities in steady, level flight. This was followed by a series of air starts, a factor crucial for any aero engine. The performance envelope of the J-79 was then explored under a host of differing flight regimes and the engine emerged with flying colors at afterburning thrust ratings up to some 13,000 pounds. The first flight qualified J-79 was then shipped across the U.S. to Edwards Air Force Base in California, where it was unpacked, ground tested, and installed for flight test. This went well, with the fuel, oil, and 100 or more electrical connections being made without major complications. The aircraft chosen for the flight trials was the XF-4D-1, prototype of the Skyray high-performance naval interceptor. Ground runs at dry and after-burning thrust were undertaken to prove the basic installation. The test aircraft with the J-79 was rolled out for its first flight on December 8, 1955 in the hands of test pilot Roy Pryor. The aircraft took off downwind to make full use of the runway. The takeoff thus needed about six miles of the famous dry lake bed at Edwards, which had been called Muroc up to 1950. The flight included a climb to 18,000 feet before Pryor returned for an evening landing. The whole flight had been a model of successful flight testing. The J-79 was soon cleared for operational service and early examples of the type were installed right from the beginning of the Phantom's production run. This was in full flood by the late 1950s after the placing of the first production contract in December 1956. This walk-round of an F-4B naval model on loan to the U.S. Air Force reveals the Phantom's major features. The pilot is seated at the front with the radar officer behind him. The latter can darken his cockpit to provide optimum conditions for viewing the radar screen by using the blind here visible inside the rear canopy. The cockpits are comparatively large and conventional by the standards of the period, but well filled with displays and controls. The crew members sit on Martin Baker Mark V ejector seats. These are designed for safe ejections at zero feet and speeds down to 150 miles per hour, and are generally triggered by pulling the overhead handle for the blind that protects the firer's face during ejection. Mach 2 performance is aided by the two fully variable ramp inlets for the J-79 engines. A splitter plate diverts the boundary layer of slow moving air close to the fuselage and the inlet ramp jackknifes out at speeds over Mach 1.4 to control the shock wave pattern, keeping these waves out of the inlet and maintaining an even flow of air at the face of the engine. 
This system is fully automatic, being controlled by the aircraft's air data computer. Navy and Air Force Phantoms generally have different tires. Both types are of the same diameter. But pictured here on the left is the broader Air Force tire, which offers greater touchdown area and is thus inflated to the lower pressures suitable for operations on the longer runways available to land-based aircraft. Located on the port side of the fuselage is a pneumatically extended ram air turbine for the generation of emergency power to maintain essential systems in the event of engine failure. Down to a speed of 225 miles per hour, the turbine provides electrical power, thereafter switching to hydraulic power for the landing systems. The centerline hardpoint for stores carriage is supplemented by four substantial pylons under the wings. On the leading edges of the wings are three section slats to maintain an even flow of air over the wings and reduce stalling speed. The key to this feature is boundary layer control using air tapped from the engine compressor and then vented through the slots here being checked. This is one of the two trailing edge flaps which are also fitted with boundary layer control. As on the leading edge system, these slots blow air tapped from the engines over the upper surface of the flap. The blowing of the flaps is designed to control the airflow and so maximize the effect of these fairly small surfaces. The flaps can be depressed a maximum of 60 degrees. This full flap setting being used for landing and a half flap setting for takeoff. Lateral control is entrusted to a combination of spoilers and ailerons, the former being used at high air speeds and the latter at low air speeds. The underside of each wing sports a hydraulically operated speed brake. These are designed to provide rapid deceleration at speeds down from Mach 2.4 at any flight attitude without buffet or a change in pitch trim. Landings can be made perfectly safely with the speed brakes extended, though at low speeds the effect of these surfaces is small. The vertical tail is long and low to ease the problem of headroom in the hangar deck of U.S. carriers and has a powered rudder for yaw control. Under the powered rudder is the vent for the complex of six fuel tanks located in the fuselage. The slab tailplane halves ensure full pitch control under all flight conditions and are angled down at 23 degrees to improve directional control by increasing the effective side area of the rear fuselage. Between the J79 tailpipes is the arrestor hook, normally stowed under the rear fuselage fairing but lowered for carrier landings. The hook is retained on land-based Phantoms and has proved valuable for short landings on runways fitted with the appropriate arrestor gear. The hook is made of a special high-strength alloy to cater for the very high forces generated in an arrested landing. Heat resistance in the rear fuselage is promoted by use of stainless steel and titanium and the use of ram air cooling. At the extreme tail is the compartment for the 16-foot braking parachute required to shorten landings on ordinary runways. The hole in the tail provides an exit for the cooling air deliberately drawn into the rear fuselage structure above the exhaust of the engines. The Phantom has always been noted for its singular appearance. One of these distinctive features is the power folding of the outer portion of each wing, normally angled up at 12 degrees. This folding system is designed to reduce the Phantom's width for movement on carrier decks and elevators. The feature is retained on land-based phantoms and has proved useful in the field.
With the wing folded, you can see the internal plumbing for the boundary layer control system. The large nose ray dome provides accommodation for the 32-inch diameter antenna of the APQ-72 main radar. Under the nose is the fairing for the infrared scanner, which was provided for backup target acquisition capability in the event of the main radar being jammed or otherwise failing. The Phantom became operational with the U.S. Navy in 1961 and squadrons were rapidly converted from older types to equip the Navy's powerful carrier force. This section shows the major elements of carrier-borne operations. The aircraft on the USS Forrestal being F-4Bs of Fighter Squadron 74, which was the Atlantic Fleet's first Phantom unit and otherwise known as the Bedevilers. Each mission is preceded by a careful briefing and the flight crews then don survival equipment over their flight suits. On the command of flight operations, the crews then proceed to their aircraft. Meanwhile, the deck crews, each wearing different colored vests for identification, have been finishing their preparations for the launch of the mission. The pilot completes his walk-round check of the aircraft. Then he and his radar officer board the Phantom. Launch weight is chalked up for the catapult officer's attention. The fleet defense role requires the pilot to fly the aircraft and control any combat, while the radar intercept officer operates the radar and controls the early stages of any interception. The two cockpit canopies are closed and the deck crew brings up the catapult bridle. The flight deck director positions each aircraft over its designated catapult and the aircraft is eased over the shuttle onto the rear section of the catapult. The bridle is then attached and any slack in the bridle is taken up by edging the catapult shuttle forward a little. The companion phantom on the second catapult goes through exactly the same preparation and all is now ready for launch as the deck crew scrambles out of the way. Cockpit checks have also been completed and the deck director signals the pilot to run his engines up to take off power. Finally the director signals the launch and the Phantom is hurled down the catapult run and over the bow of the carrier at a speed of 185 miles per hour. As the first two depart on their combat air patrol, another pair of Phantoms taxis up for launch. As each reaches the launch spot, Deflectors are raised to divert the exhaust gases away from the flight deck. Meanwhile, the shuttle is returned, 
and the next phantom designated for that catapult taxis its nose wheel unit over the shuttle and lines itself up with the catapult as the deck crew bring up the bridle. The launch sequence continues with up to four aircraft dispatched almost simultaneously. Further aircraft are being brought up in the deck edge elevators. And launches continue, in this instance with a triple dispatch. Powerful radar and a combination of Sparrow medium range and Sidewinder short range missiles, the Phantom was the world's first fighter with search and destroy capability independent of ground control and thus a great asset for the U.S. Navy in the 1960s. Indications of its service capabilities were soon being given by a number of world records. In December 1959, the Phantom set a zoom climb to altitude record of 98,556 feet. In September 1960, it took two closed circuit records at 1,217 and 1,390 miles per hour. Less than a year later, in August 1961, a low altitude speed record of 903 miles per hour was set. And this was swiftly followed in November by an absolute world speed record of 1,606 miles per hour. But perhaps the most spectacular of these early achievements came in May 1961 to mark the 50th anniversary of naval aviation. Five prototype Phantoms flew west to east across the U.S. in two hours, 47 minutes, shattering the previous best. At the end of the patrol, the Phantoms return to the carrier and come in to land. As it approaches at 150 miles per hour, each aircraft is checked visually to ensure that the landing gear and flaps are lowered, and then talked down by the landing signal officer once his assistant has reported a clear deck. As the pilot lines up for his approach, he is guided by an amber light called the meatball, seen here on the right of the flight deck. The pilot keeps this lined up with the row of green lights to ensure that he is in the groove, the correct glide slope to fly his aircraft onto the deck and catch the wire. There are different light angle approach settings for each type of aircraft on board. After each landing, 
the wire is disengaged from the arrestor hook and returned to its position as the landed aircraft taxis out of the way so that the next can come in without delay. After landing, the aircraft are struck down to the hangar deck on the four deck edge elevators and begin the maintenance cycle before another mission. The four Forrestal class ships each have some three and a half acres of maintenance area below the flight deck. But even this allows only half of the carrier's 90 aircraft to be sheltered at any one time. Throughout the 1960s and early 70s, the Phantom in F-4B and the upgraded more powerful F-4J versions provided the U.S. Navy's first line of air defense. Out to a radius of 400 miles from the carrier, the Phantom remained unexcelled for combat air patrol until the advent of the Grumman F-14 Tomcat. On occasion, during the Vietnam War, U.S. Navy Phantoms operated as attack aircraft from land bases on detachment from their parent carriers. These are F-4J aircraft evolved from the initial F-4B with more powerful engines and drooping ailerons to supplement the flaps. Slotted and therefore more effective tailplanes. Another major Phantom operator in Vietnam was the U.S. Marine Corps, and a key shore-based marine aviation component was Marine Aircraft Group 13, based at Chu Lai in 1968. Aircraft were kept in blast-proof revetments between missions as a way of reducing the effect of communist rocket and mortar attacks on airfields, and also to make more difficult any close attack by Viet Cong sappers. Before boarding the Phantom, the crew complete the standard walk-round check that the aircraft has no evident defects. The underwing pods are checked for full attachment, complete loading, and proper electrical connection. And the safing of the 2.75-inch rockets. The main landing gear wheel well is examined for any sign of hydraulic or fuel leaks. A quick look satisfies that the Mark IV 20 mm cannon pod is loaded with ammunition and revealing no obvious failings. The bomb load is completed with triplets of retarded high explosive bombs loaded onto the wing pylons by the ordnance crew using a special jack-up bomb trolley. Flagged safety pins are inserted before the trolley is removed. A safety wire is fitted on each bomb to prevent its arming until after it has been dropped. As it falls, the wire breaks, thus freeing the nose-mounted propeller to turn the requisite number of times and so arm the weapon. The two crew members complete the standard walk-round check and board the aircraft. With the aid of ground crew, they strap in and then put on their bone dome helmets and flame resistant gloves. The next task is the cockpit check, achieved with the aid of a special list. 
All moving surfaces receive a final visual check and test as the ground crew remove flagged pins and safeties. The flags are then clearly shown to the pilot. Loaded with 12 bombs and a centerline drop tank, the F-4B of Marine Fighter Attack Squadron 115 taxis out for takeoff. Other Phantoms slated for the mission join up on the runway. Before clearing for takeoff, the crew confirm that the outer wings have been locked down and then depart for another tactical sortie in support of Marine Corps ground forces. The steadily increasing scope of U.S. operations in Vietnam during the later 60s meant the steady expansion and improvement of bases used by aircraft such as the Phantom, which requires fully paved runways. Here, Marines lay a temporary extension to a paved runway. Then as now, ground operations required support at all times of the day and night and in all weather conditions. So the ability of Marine Aviation Phantom Squadrons to respond rapidly was a key feature in the success of Marine Corps ground forces in Vietnam. The Phantom pilots prided themselves on the accurate delivery of a wide variety of ordnance close to the friendly forces forward positions and this too was of great significance in crisis situations. Constant pressure could thus be exerted on the enemy, whose precise location was radio relayed by the ground forces or a forward air controller. Excessive waves of aircraft could be used to keep up the air pressure on the hostile ground forces and also permitted different types of ordnance to be called in as dictated by the circumstances of each tactical situation. The major operator of the Phantom in Vietnam was the U.S. Air Force, starting with the F-4C land-based version of the F-4B, and then the modestly improved F-4D with enhanced ground attack capability. Although vulnerable to communist guerrilla attack, a centralized fueling system, such as this at Cam Ranh Bay, offered handy advantages for tactical operations and was therefore used in Vietnam. The Phantom's high fuel consumption militated against quick reaction units being held on the runway, but circumstances often meant that the Air Force had to do it, for only thus could maximum aerial firepower be brought to bear against the Communist forces without delay.
Heat fatigue to the crews waiting on the runway under the scorching tropical sun was another factor to be considered when fully manned and weaponed aircraft were kept on standby. But again, speed of reaction was the overriding factor so that the Phantoms could be scrambled quickly. After the standard preparation and takeoff, sometimes with reduced fuel to allow the maximum possible war load to be uplifted, the Air Force's Phantoms often linked up with a Boeing KC-135 tanker to top up their tanks and thus increase combat radius with a war load of up to 16,000 pounds of external stores. Here, the boomer in the tanker flies the boom into the Phantom's dorsal receptacle for fuel transfer. The Phantom was the attack aircraft par excellence in Vietnam. The type offering a good combination of war load and range with exceptional airframe strength and first class avionics to ensure that the right target was attacked with considerable accuracy. This piece of film was shot during an attack and clearly shows the Phantom's ability to tackle heavily defended outcountry targets in North Vietnam. Just as effectively as less well defended targets of opportunity in the in-country war over South Vietnam. Outcountry targets included vital communication links, power plants and strategic stockpiles all ringed with anti-aircraft guns and missiles. Even in conditions of cloud, the Phantoms were able to get through and unload their weapons. The Vietnam War witnessed the use of the USAF's whole spectrum of tactical weapons, including all types of free fall and retarded high explosive bomb. Retarded bombs were designed to allow the attacking aircraft to drop accurately at low level, yet get away before the force of the explosion. Phantoms also operated in tight patterns at medium altitudes, all dropping their bombs on the command of the leader to deliver ordnance with maximum concentration. Napalm was a particularly important weapon in the U.S. tactical effort during the Vietnam War. The initial F-4C was an effective machine but was developed into the F-4D with improvements such as APQ-109A rather than APQ-100 radar and the ASG-22 sight. But both models lacked an internal gun, so the carriage of a cannon pod became frequent in both the air-to-air -air and air-to-surface roles. This is an SUU-16A pod being loaded with its 1,200 rounds of 20 millimeter ammunition. The pod features an external ram turbine to power the cannon, and this restricts the aircraft to speeds below 400 miles per hour during the firing pass. 
Thus, its use was confined mainly to the air-to-ground role as demonstrated in these sequences of typical ground attack passes. The SUU-16A and the SUU-23A self-powered version for the high-speed air-to-air roll were a solution, admittedly not ideal, to the Phantom's lack of an internal gun. The Phantom also operated with air-to-surface missiles such as the 12,000-yard range bullpup. And as noted before, the main air-to-air -air fit was based on the medium-range Sparrow and short-range Sidewinder. Air combat was not a frequent occurrence in the Vietnam War. But MiG fighters were sometimes met and generally downed, as here with a Sparrow missile. And sometimes by cannon fire, as in this classic camera gun film. The definitive USAF version was the F-4E, which introduced an M61 Vulcan 20mm cannon in the lower nose, together with the smaller diameter APQ-120 radar, uprated engines, a slotted tailplane, and maneuvering slats on the outer wing panels. As on earlier Phantom variants, provision was also made for podded electronic countermeasures such as this jammer pod carried in the port forward Sparrow missile recess. The Phantom soon secured large export orders and rapidly became the West's most important tactical fighter. There have been 11 overseas operators of the Phantom, namely Australia, Greece, West Germany, Turkey, South Korea, Japan, Iran, Egypt and its erstwhile opponent Israel, Spain, and the United Kingdom. Though only the third largest of the Phantom's overseas purchasers in terms of aircraft numbers, the UK opted for a much revised basic model derived from the U.S. Navy's F-4J, but fitted with two Rolls-Royce Spey after-burning turbofans as the F-4K for the Royal Navy and F-4M for the RAF. This required a considerable revision of the fuselage, and the extra drag resulting from this modification obviated the advantages of the more powerful and fuel-efficient power plant. The Phantom FG Mark I naval variant has AWG-11 fire control radar and a number of British features. Among its weapons were the Sparrow missile and the two-inch rocket, the latter carried in multiple pods under the wings. 
The FG Mark I remained in service with the fleet air arm until the Royal Navy was forced to phase out its fixed wing carrier strength in the mid-1970s. The Royal Air Force was then allocated the survivors of the Fleet Air Arms 52 aircraft. The RAF's Phantom FRG Mark II has AWG-12 fire control radar and a British nav attack system. The accompanying sequence shows typical peacetime ground attack training with rockets, cannon pods and practice bombs. Contact the target, master arms going on, and the camera's going on. Going right a bit. Firing. Now, and point. The 150 British Phantoms are now tasked primarily with air defense of the UK and have a secondary responsibility for fighter ground attack. Number 41 Squadron is typical of the seven British Phantom squadrons. Two of these fly ex-naval FG Mark I's and a third has ex-U.S. Navy F-4Js, required because of the Royal Air Force's increased commitment in the South Atlantic after the Falklands War of 1982. Modern developments have emphasized alternative roles such as reconnaissance and defense suppression. The most radical development has been the F-4ES, high altitude photo reconnaissance variant of the F-4E used only by Israel. This has a completely modified nose section for the special HIAC-1 oblique photo equipment, which allows this high altitude aircraft to see deep into enemy territory while the aircraft remains in the comparative safety of friendly airspace. Israel is also upgrading its fighter models. Japan, South Korea and West Germany also see a future for their fighters after extensive upgrading by those countries' own aircraft industries. Over the years, the Phantom has shown extraordinary adaptability in a wide range of roles and has thus operated with many weapon types on its five hard points. Some of the most important are illustrated in the next few sequences. Unguided rockets have been especially significant for area ground attack. The types most commonly used are the 2.75 inch and more rarely 5 inch types fired from launchers of varying sizes against soft battlefield targets such as troop concentrations unarmored vehicles and artillery positions.
For the air-to-air -air role, the short-range infrared guided sidewinder has proved more successful than the medium-range Sparrow, which homes onto the reflections of the launch aircraft's radar bouncing from the target. The Phantom can carry four Sparrows under the fuselage and two or four sidewinders on underwing hard points for maximum flexibility in the air-to-air -air role. This sequence shows a Convair F-102 Delta Dagger pilotless drone taking off as target. model Sidewinder scores a hit in the tailpipe. This leads to the successive breakup of the drone as it tumbles out of control. Saturation and precision bombing against point and area targets have both been undertaken with the gamut of U.S. bomb types, including the highly effective high-blast demolition types. Cannon pods have also proved highly successful in the air-to-ground role, the 20mm types being the more common, though 30mm pods can be carried. Multiple pods have proved devastating in the air-to-surface role. As the most important type in U.S. Navy and U.S. Air Force service during the 1960s and early 70s, the Phantom was used by the aerobatic display team of each service. The Navy team is the Blue Angels, which used the F-4J until the rising price of fuel forced a change to the McDonnell Douglas A-4F Skyhawk in 1974. The Air Force team is the Thunderbirds, which used the F-4E until it too switched to a smaller and more economical type. In this instance, the Northrop T-38A Talon. As the Phantom has been the Western world's most widely built and extensively used combat aircraft since World War II, production milestones for this great aircraft are worth reviewing. The 1000th Phantom was an F-4B for the U.S. Navy and was delivered on July 7, 1965. Two years later, the 2000th Phantom followed as an F-4D for the U.S. Air Force. This was handed over on February 21st, 1967. Just 17 months later, the 3000th Phantom came off the line. 
This F-4J went to the U.S. Navy on August 28, 1968. An F-4E for the U.S. Air Force became the 4,000th Phantom when it emerged on February 1, 1971. Finally, on May 24, 1978, the 5,000th Phantom was an F-4E delivered to the Turkish Air Force. <laughs> 